All right. Well, I think we're about to uh, kick this off before our panel get too involved in their conversations. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I have a page of housekeeping I have to read through, so just bear with me while we'll, um, we do that. Uh, hello and welcome to Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival 2021. It's fantastic to be back in real life. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you crime lovers in person. Um, hopefully you're all socially distancing. And um, if you're not with us in the room and you're coming uh, to us with Zoom, hello. Um, we have people um, all around New South Wales watching from their local library and from home, courtesy of our wonderful library program. Um, and do first of all, we have to say that we... Um, we at BAD acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm insert name, no I'm not, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Metcalf Auditorium today for this interview with BM Carroll, Catherine Jinks and Sarah Barry. Um, now we also have to do some little COVID announcements as well. Uh, so uh, as you've already seen, we're following COVID protocols. We're all double vaxxed. We've all checked in with our QR codes and we should keep our masks on except when eating or drinking or in the case of our speakers when we're on the stage. Uh, social distancing means there are restricted numbers in the room. So please try to respect the protocols. Hand sanitizer is available at the door and let a volunteer know if you are feeling unwell. We ask you to mute your mobile phones and don't record the session. If you are taking photos, please turn off the flash. Now feel free to share on social media at Bad Crime Sydney, or one word, or hashtag Bad Crime Sydney, um, so that we uh, can let everyone who isn't here know what they're missing out on. Now we will have around 10 to 15 minutes of questions after the conversation. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please send your questions through using the chat function, and we will try to um, ask them for you. Uh, so let's uh, let's get this started. So joining me today is um, is BM Carroll, Catherine Jinks, and Sarah Barry. Now we have almost a library of books on the stage when we kind of look at how many books these uh, wonderful authors have written. Catherine has written nearly fifty. Uh, BM or Burr has around ten, and Sarah has eight. But I was talking in the um, in the green room. There's another couple already winging their way to the publisher, which is um, quite daunting. Now, as we've been talking about COVID, I thought that it was probably a, um, a good way to sort of kick this discussion off and sort of talk about, well, you know, how has COVID been for, um, for you authors? Have you sort of found it a productive time? Have you found it a, um, a miserable time? Um, well, I think I started off a little bit like everybody. I was quite crazy um, and I couldn't write and I couldn't read. Um, which for me is um, really devastating. I can get over the not writing. And, and then after about four weeks of trying to get used to my writing space and my house being invaded by my family who were there all day long um, and conducting meetings and classes and were really noisy, I eventually um, found a little corner of the bedroom and um, you can lock the door of our bedroom and I went in there and I change my writing space to an armchair in there and then I was extraordinarily productive and I I think I wrote my last book in in nine months which for me is a really quick turnaround yeah. so I went from a complete disaster to a you know um rather a happy ending and quite a productive period of my my career well so the armchair might be a new normal um yeah I have although I've, I'm sure um you know, um, physiotherapists would look at what I'm doing and say it's really bad practice, but it's, I quite like it. I don't know if I'll ever yeah. go back to a desk. Yeah, it's kind of funny how when we just change something quite simple like that, it actually completely changes our process and our practice. It does. What about you? Oh, I, working? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, no, no writing. <laughs> homeschooling, months and months of homeschooling. Um, we had like a family office at home, but I kicked everyone else out of that um, and just completely took it over. I had no time to really just sit down and plot. So what I ended up doing was going to Officeworks and buying these sheets of, um, it's, it's like whiteboard sheets. 
and I stuck them all over every wall in the office and I'd be doing a maths question or an English question with my kids and I'd, I'd have an idea so I'd run in and just scribble all over the walls and then when um, I had a chance, I'd have to go in and, and just jigsaw piece it all back together. And, and that's pretty much how I plotted my last book. But it is very, it's going to be good, I promise. It's, <laughs> it's very good and very cohesive. Alarmingly after that. It's <laughs> uh, well, my last book, The Attack, came out smack bang in the middle of the really bad lockdown where Sydney and Melbourne were both locked down and all the bookshops were locked down. So it didn't do well. So I have to say, it's not been great. Um, and in terms of how I, well, I sit in a little box up in the Blue Mountains. My daughter's down here, so she's grown up, so didn't make any difference to me at all. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, a lot of writers I've been speaking to, they've either had the, the either or experience of it's been fantastic, and they've been really productive, or it's been, you know, terrible. And it's just such a... Um, it is sort of such a strange thing because you there think, were a couple of days of you know when the new things happen like yep. something happens and you can't can't get off social media there was some of that mm -hmm. um, but apart from that it wasn't much of a difference yeah yep. well today we're talking about the uh, the past is never past and so I was wondering whether because the books are quite they sort of they are similar they're they're all of the the um, the protagonists are dealing with something coming back from their past, funnily enough. And I was wondering whether it is possible for, for us to escape our past, or is it always something that's going to come, come back into our, our lives? Am I okay to go? Um, all right. Um, I, I've thought about this um, quite a bit, and, you know, I do think the past is part of our, our DNA and it informs everything we do today. And, and in many ways, you know, um, that saying that time heals all wounds, I don't know if that's necessarily true, because I think as you get older and wiser, you look back at things that happened when you were younger and naive, and you get angrier about them and you realize that's not appropriate. So um, I think in, in novels, um, you know, the past um, rearing its head and confronting characters is something that mirrors what's ha what happens in real life yeah because your characters um they, they they've kind of moved beyond it a little bit but the, it's come back in a big way in such a fantastic premise um with your with your novel here which is you had it coming um and basically it starts with someone's been shot and the paramedic that's sent to uh, pick them up knows who who they are and yeah the, yeah she and I have to say um uh, as the writer of that novel I had a lot of trouble with that coincidence that the paramedic is called out to the shooting and she knows the victim and 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 things like that do happen in real life but in fiction you're trying not to rely too hard on coincidence so I spent a lot of the novel trying to figure out how do I get the paramedic paramedic to this um, incident without it being a coincidence and I remember the moment when I figured out how you know it wasn't a coincidence was yeah. um, you know very gratifying it took me a long time to figure out how to work that one out. I think you allowed one coincidence one coincidence <laughs> not two that's it. Yes the rule's been laid down uh, that's why I didn't find that uh, um, a coincidence that when I was reading it I sort of just found that perfectly normal. I thought, well, of course, a paramedic will turn up at, at times and know the, the victim. Yeah, but it was, um, that's true. And it, it does happen. And the paramedics I interviewed, you know, did say there was at least, you know, three or four occasions where they knew, um, over their career, where they knew the patient, you know, a woman from church or somebody they'd known. One of them, you know, came across this boy she used to like at school who was very hot at school and not hot as a very drunk 50 year old man who was semi-conscious and and I know that but it was still a lot of fun for me as a writer to figure out a way to get that paramedic there at that time um and yep. you know so it kind it of, also, it kind of it, amused me it's, it's a lot less of a coincidence if you're in a country town yes true yeah, yeah. yeah. I might set um, my next novel in a country town Catherine and avoid <laughs> Sydney 
Which is probably, I mean, that's a good point with with your book, Catherine, because you're not only is the past a small community, but you've put your character on a an island as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, what what did you? What was the question? <laughs> I was going to say that you know, with her, like her her life has been completely destroyed by the the events in the past, yeah. and she's kind of fled, and the past has almost come to track her down hasn't it yeah I, it's funny when you were talking about that when you said you know the past comes to us and all that and I'm I always think in terms of literary structure so you know for a novel it's good it's a good way of bringing tension in fairly early to have some past thing happening like with a film you don't it's less of a like you can be but a lot of films can start off the characters, the person you see right in front of them, you don't need to know much and it goes from there. But often in a novel, you have to bring a past and you have to have some, some you know, the, the, the characters are often have to be a little bit more fully fleshed out. So the past has to feature. And then I'm thinking, oh, he's talking about real life. Oh, geez, real life. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? All my yeah. concentration is on this whole concept of literary structure and yeah. all that. But the, the um, backstory is actually really hard to, to manage when you're writing because mm. it's like too much and it's boring and it gets in the way of, you know, the forward momentum. Mm -hmm. So it is quite a juggling act, isn't it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, the, the Shelter, the book before this one, it was um, little flashbacks. This one was alternating chapters. Um, yeah, you have to try and work out how to handle it, especially like... I've done non-thriller type fiction. Keeping the pacing up mm. and having the past, that is where the challenge is. That's where the challenge is. So, yeah, with, with a, say, a historical novel or a romance, it's not quite as the pace isn't as important. I mean, it is important, but it's different. It's not as you, you don't want to, if it's a thriller, it's got to be fairly breakneck. You know, you've got to keep yeah. people reading. So, yeah. And how do you... Are you a big plotter when you're sort of mapping out your, your stories? Or? Yeah, that was um, when I was many, many years ago, when I was writing children's fiction and my second, second, I, I didn't, I, I started off not plotting, like, you know, when I was 25 or whatever. And some of the people I know, like Ursula Dubasarsky, she, she doesn't plot exactly. She knows vaguely where she's going, but she kind of follows it. Um, after trying to do that and then not being able to finish the book, I realised I would have to start plotting. Yeah. See, because I didn't sort of start in the thriller. Anyway, so um, now I'm like a screenwriter. I Like I've got 50 pages of synopsis and all that before I even start. Yeah. I think I re um, James Elroy, I heard an interview with him and he his outlines are 450 pages. I thought, that's a novel. Yeah, What's left? <laughs> And what about you, Sarah? I mean, your your, um, your character hasn't so much been destroyed by the past. She's kind of embraced it and been driven. Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, you know, when you come, you do the research about uh, people that have experienced horrible things like child abuse. Um, it really does shape who you are. Yeah. Uh, there's no getting away from that. And it does take uh, most survivors a very long time if not a lifetime to try and get past that and um, you know we know that even when they escape the threat um, there's still so many problems like reduced social skills and um, poor schooling outcomes and of course um, all the all the mental um, issues like the um, eating disorders and uh, substance abuse, um, increased risk of criminal behaviour. There's just so many things that they have to get past a lot of them. And oh, when I was reading those stories, it was it was really heartbreaking. It was a really hard um, issue to tackle. And so when I created Lexi, um, my main character, I had to try to take all that into account to make her a very real character. But I also um, I also wanted to make her really resilient and and someone that we all like to think we could be if we'd come through something like that. So as far as the past um, never being the past, even though, yes, she's she's out there and she's trying to make something the best of a bad situation, it still really threads into every decision she makes and all mm. in the way that she acts. Yeah. 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 And what um, what drew you to that 
you know, that crime? I've always felt very strongly about it and I spent a lot of time ignoring it on purpose because I needed to work out a way that I could write something that involved that subject matter in a way that people would still want to pick the book up and I could still make it an attaining read and and not put people off, readers off altogether. And it took a really long time to come up with something that I think is, it's not a book about child abuse, it's a book about a survivor who um, comes out of her shell and really becomes the best person she can be in order to turn around what's happened to her in a positive light. Um, and, you know, the, the figures and when you, when you look into it, I think it's something that we all need to be a little bit more aware of. Mm. Um, I don't usually write something with an agenda like that, but um, I'm kind of hoping that people can, can read an uplifting story and still be a little bit more aware about what we generally tend to try to ignore because it's just so awful. Yeah. And, and what about you, Bert? Where did you sort of first sort of find your, your story idea? Um, I, there was a few things that happened. Um, one was I was researching um, one of my earlier novels. It was a good, you know, 20 years ago. And um, a criminal lawyer was helping me. And um, at the time I was asking her my, you know, my little naive questions. And I found out that she was um, representing this woman who had stabbed her husband on the Roringa Freeway in rush hour traffic. Um, I'm sure some people here would remember that crime because it was a really shocking crime at the time. And, and I remember thinking, you know, why are you representing this woman? You know, what kind of defense can she possibly have? She's definitely stabbed him to death. You know, a motorist had to pull her off him. It was very evident that she did what she did. And um, and she said, because, you know, what happened, you know, on the Ringo Freeway that morning was only one part of the story. And um, and, you know, everybody, no matter what they've done, deserves a very thorough defense. So in my novel, the person who shot is a defense lawyer. He is um, and he, he has made his career out of defending sexual assault cases. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of very angry people because he's very good at his job and he's so good at his job that, you know, a great number of offenders have have walked free. Mm. So um, that was one element of the story. And the other element that kind of, I guess, also um, comes from, you know, a personal experience was a, a party that we had for my son's 16th birthday that um, had an ambulance called an hour into the party and kind of um, that particular party and, and seeing those teenagers and really reminded me of what it was like to be that age and to be that vulnerable and to be that reckless and how, you know, one mistake can have lifelong consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, it's, it's, you know, as we're sort of talking about the past, um, that sort of teenage experience, I, mean, I think we've all got teaching in our backgrounds at some point. Um, I don't, I don't have teaching. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, with, with your book, um, Catherine, I mean, I found it so um, almost traumatic because it was almost like going back into the classroom <laughs> and having to deal with you know horrible parents and you know the stresses of teaching um, yeah actually I was never a teacher either um, but my sister-in-law is a teacher and I've got two really really good friends who are teachers yeah. and I spent like years listening to them and I'm just thinking I'm getting so annoyed for them like I'm like this is outrageous. You've got to be kidding. Really? Oh, my God. You know, this sort no, of they thing. would have been telling the truth. Yeah, absolutely they were. <laughs> and I was like, I just got to the point where, oh, I, sometimes that sort of, that slight sense of outrage that people have to put up with things is a good way of getting people to keep reading the book because they get invested too because they get really outraged, which is, yeah, so basically that book was partly written for all my teacher friends who then got, they're talking about, oh, my God, I don't know if I could read that. Like, oh, my God, I think I just, it, I triggered, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, well, that's good. Like I was thinking that's good because I got it right. You know what I mean? It's like the, 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 the first one, Shelter, that was of those kind of ones. That was um, about a woman who, um is brought into a sort of an underground network of people hiding 
women who are on the run with their children from law, like court orders for taking the children away or, yeah. And it has the best twist ever. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but um, that was where I kind of, um, that that was where I thought, oh, I have to, um, I really wanted to talk about that because it was, it was a, it was a sort of, and but at the same time, I was thinking, see, this is this kind of domestic violence thing or domestic abuse, and it's delicate, and I hope I bloody get this right. I'm really worried that I've, you know, like blah blah blah. But then it was mentioned on the a list. It was only three novels on this list of reading for the for a sort of domestic abuse awareness campaign in WA, and that was just. Can I just say that's one of the greatest honors because I got it right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, what a relief. So yeah, getting it right is the main thing when I can't like what you were tackling. I'm like gutsy, so <laughs> gutsy, like so gutsy. Cause I'd be so scared that I wasn't going to get it right. You know? Lots and lots of research. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, and it was very unique. Um, you know, Lexi, wh who she was and her kind of character and, and, um, and what she ended up, you know, working as and, and helping with the case. I was really curious, um, all that tech stuff, is that in your past? Is that in all that tech knowledge that Lexi had? Oh, um, no, my brother's okay. the one that he, he can, yeah, you put him in front of a computer and it's scary. So there was a little bit of um, a to and froing there. So I knew what I was talking about, but um, yeah, no, I'm not tech savvy at all. Really. Introduce me to your brother so I can <laughs> ask him questions. <laughs> That's an interesting point, though, isn't it? Because, you know, where do you go for your research? It's, is it, you know, are you happy to talk to strangers? Are you, you know, contacts? Um, yes, I'll talk to anyone that'll talk to me if I'm trying to yeah. find something out. Um, but I do have, um, I've built up quite a few contacts um, police officers and um, people in the medical fields, different medical fields, and I really rely on them really heavily. And it's just meeting the right people and getting to know them. The ones that don't care if you message them at midnight, you know, the day before a book's due and say, uh, help, I've just found out I need to know this. Um, yeah, having a really strong group around you is really important for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because it's funny, you know, people love talking about their lives. And if you find the right person, they'll just give you everything yeah. detectives are very um you know they're hard to crack though detectives have they've got stories. a detective face <laughs> and when you're asking them lots of questions you can tell you know you can only go so far i feel you can only go so far with detectives yeah and i find that, that because they're they have to rehearse their yeah. thing for court it's like you ask them something it's like yes well i was walking and the perpetrator did this and then we did it and <laughs> <laughs> and they, they won't ever say anything out of turn or uh, no, in my no. experience. So I always make sure I have ready exactly what I want to ask. And, and I always get off the phone very quickly because I always feel they're far too busy to be talking to me. And if you've got someone you can ring at midnight, I'd like their number too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just start a list, shall I? <laughs> well, you know what? To put, this is honest to God's because you do, you, tr you try and find the people, blah, blah, blah. God, trying to find contact traces for this last one. Anyway, I think that some kind of writer's institution should set up this group of database. like a database of, of people with their phone numbers and who are willing to talk to authors. Hey? Very good yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> Although, our, you know, all our books might end up slightly similar Catherine if we have the same true too. resources <laughs> yeah no I'm just no not necessarily just people for the, the basic you know if you need a social worker and all of they have to say if you need a you know like it you know not necessarily the the ideas and the plots but the just the the program you know the processes the great idea mm. yeah. we'll have to get a grant. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to, uh, we're kind of getting off topic now, aren't we? <laughs> I've lost my place in my notes. Um, I, I really wanted to, um, because you've all kind of written so much and, and your books are quite various, um, varied over over the um, over your catalogue. You know, what was the, the um, what was it that sort of drove you to sort of start writing? I don't remember when I started writing. I've just always um, been writing something or other from... Yeah. 
from day dot. So um, it just took me sort of 35 years to get the guts to send something in to see if I can get it published. But um, I just really, uh, I just really enjoy the process. I like getting really involved in a story and, and getting it down. And it's really rewarding when you get it out there and, and other people enjoy it. Mm. Um, I, my first I, a novel, I think I started writing when I was 27. So um, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was, you know, quite young. And, um, and I was, I always had an ambition to write a novel. And I, I, I at the time I worked in um, IT, um, I was a finance manager in IT, and I wrote a company, or I wrote a, a book about an IT company that was having a fraud, and the finance manager was a lead character. And then I completely denied that it was about me, but um, it was published, and I think half the people who bought it were my colleagues to see if they were in it. And then after that, I got to the second book, and I had to make it up. <laughs> and, and ever since then, every single book it's got, in some ways, it's got easier because I know what I'm doing, but um, in other ways, it's got harder because it, especially, you know, when you're on your 10th novel and you've described so many shower scenes and so many kind of, you know, daily routine scenes, you really are scratching your head for new ways to say, you know, the minute of, you know, of life. And 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 so some ways I, I found my last novel really hard because I, I had nothing left to draw on that I hadn't used before. Yeah. That's interesting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine doesn't have this problem because she's so <laughs> prolific. I do. I mean, try, you know, when you, you know, when there's a lot of driving and like you have to find a million ways to talk about pulling off the road and stuff that I, I, that's yeah. the sort of, that's, a, that's the sort of small version of that. Yeah. Um, I started, I was the same. I'd started really, really young, wrote my first novel when I was 12, that kind of stuff. So, um, and then was lucky enough to know somebody who knew an agent when I was 26 with my first children's and it was easy to get it published from, from that way. So I've sort of been doing it since then. And I've always wanted to, because I'm a big reader, like can't, you know, have to have my book. Yeah. So, yeah, when you, it's like playing the piano, like if you like music, you end up trying to play an instrument, you know, it's that sort of thing, I think. Mm. Is there an author that inspires you? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, well, there were the ones from early days that did, you know, like, oh, I suppose George Orwell and, um, um, well, when I was a kid, C.S. Lewis, I mean, I've, I've ended up writing C.S. lewis -y stuff, yeah. you know, like, so I suppose it all comes back in the end. And then, of course, other authors as you go along, like, you know, like Evelyn War, because he's just, uh, he's like dialogue so good. And just, I mean, you know, even people like, oh, and, you know, just as thriller writers you know then you 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 love you know you love people who are nice and snappy like you know like Michael Connolly or whatever you know like you know what I mean it's just you just get you you when it whatever you happen to be I just get bored very easily which is why I sort of jump from thing to thing but whatever you're doing at the moment for me I'm like okay well for example I had a horror I horror idea once and I thought oh well I don't write horror and I thought oh well the worst thing in the world wasting an idea a good idea I can't bear it that's the worst thing in the world so I'm like well I could probably do this let me just read a whole bunch of Stephen King you know so you know so it's it's like that I guess yeah yeah because yeah, that's the, the um the great thing about these panels is that we're all readers as well as writers so it's kind of it's always interesting to kind of hear what um what other sort of crime writers the, the crime writers are reading so it's I haven't actually caught up with Michael Connolly's latest yet but um no, I haven't. Love it when I haven't gotten, I haven't read the latest Michael Connolly. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and so, in in terms of that sort of um, that back catalogue, what has changed for you as a writer through the, the the writing of the books? Is the what could you go back to that um, that young author and say, "This is here's some tips I've learned along the way." Oh, I, I think you just have to go through the process I could tell myself 13 years ago a whole lot of things but it's the it's the practice and the writing and the and the evolution natural evolution as you 
um, get each book out that that um, inspires the next one. So I'm not really sure yeah. that it would change anything. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? Kind of like this apprenticeship that you have yes. to go through, and 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 it's particularly poignant when you're talking to young writers and you know, they're amazing and they've got amazing talent and amazing use of language, but what they don't have is life experience. And so it's very hard for them to talk authentically about, you know, um, lots of things because they haven't experienced it. Mm. Um, so I, I do think, um, you know, getting a, a bit older helps with writing. Um, and, and as Sarah said, it's, you have to go through, you know, you have to go through and learn your craft. And, yeah. and the only way to do that is just doing it. And yeah. I, I kind of wonder whether like the last sort of two years is really going to change a lot of that kind of writing experience because we are like, we need to kind of be in the world to get our material and we haven't been able to do that. I mean, is, is, do you think that um, we're going to have to have a period of sort of restocking the, the ideas? I'm being called for jury duty next week and I'm going there so fast you're going to see skin marks. <laughs> I can't wait. I'll be like, pick me, pick me, please. Unfortunately, I think as soon as you say you're a crime writer. <laughs> as far as I know, they don't know your profession, but I think I'll look so eager they'll think something is wrong with me. <laughs> it's, sort of a, it's quite a, yeah, no, I work there. Um, in terms of sort of the that sort of personal experience, I mean, is that something that you're drawing on? Like, have you do you sort of see you know the jury duty as, as being research, or do you see absolutely? It as I, I, I and it's duty? not like a case. It's nothing to do with whatever that case would be, and it's just the process and being allowed inside a court because um, you know um, getting yourself into those um, places is is hard sometimes. Um, yeah. And so it's just being able to go in there and see, you know, the mechanics of how it works. And, and just from being called for jury duty, I've had three new book ideas <laughs> and nothing. I haven't even stepped inside there and I probably won't even get picked. But just the fact that my routine has been upset and I, I'm going to have to go into the city and change what I'm doing on a daily basis. It's like having a new job. It's, it's quite exciting, actually. I, I'd mm. be quite devastated. <laughs> I probably won't get picked. <laughs> Because we don't kind of see the those behind the scenes things, so it's going to be quite a quite a rare thing. But um, we should get back to the books. Uh, so so you've written um, all of you have written standalone, and you've written series. Do you prefer one over the other, or is it more driven by the the story at the time? Definitely story driven, because yeah. sometimes you just can't get everything get through everything in one book. It's not realistic. Um, but also if you uh, create a great bunch of characters that you get quite attached to it is fun to follow them through for a little bit longer also yeah. though by the end of a series I'm so sick to death of them I never want to talk to them again so <laughs> it's yeah it's a little bit of both I suppose yeah. it's always exciting to start a new one um, actually it's interesting talking about that and and also with refer reference to that development of writing um, since I've been doing it for so long um, one of the things I've noticed <clears throat> is how everything changes. So my writing style has changed because the tastes have changed. Like I, I look back now and I think, Christ, I just buggered around for so long, you know, didn't get to the point. I'm thinking I, it still won awards, but it won awards at the time. And like what's happened is, for example, especially with kids, the, th the three act film structure has kind of become the dominant literary structure as well like because people see so many films and they're used to that structure and so once upon a time you didn't have to but now you pretty much have to especially in thrillers and and also um and um the the whole thing about like oh god sorry yeah <laughs> sorry i just lost my thread but um the other, the other thing we were just talking about, which was standalone and series or series, series, yeah. So it depends. Like with with pagans, with my pagan books, which were these fairly successful young people's books, he wouldn't leave me alone. He literally wouldn't leave me alone. Like he was literally at my shoulder. Like I couldn't get him out of my head until I'd done sort of about four or five. Mm -hmm. Whereas, say with Evil Genius, 
which was another successful one, that went to America. Suddenly they, they said, yeah, we want more of those and we'll pay you this much money. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. No problems. So, you know, it depends really. Like circumstances dictate. Yeah. 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 I've never written a series, just to put it on record. <laughs> and actually I was um, so interested watching um, Sarah set up her next book um, when I read Unforgiven. It was, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of looking forward to the next one because she's such a great character, which is kind of the, the another question I was going to ask is sort of, does the character come first for your your books or is it more the, the, the story and plot? Definitely with Unforgiven, the character. Yeah. Um, Lexi is um, one of those ones that gets in your head and you just, yeah, like you are saying, she's got so much to say and she's there in the back of my mind all the time and I'm, I really enjoy writing her. So I was really looking forward to, to doing more books um, with Lexi. Um, but of course you've got to have an event that that's going to carry that character through and make her believable and make people want to read more and, and that's going to shape that character and, and make them what they are. So a bit of character, a bit of event, but, um, with Unforgiven, you know, Lexi was my starting point for sure. It's funny how characters infect us and sort of, they, they won't leave us alone sometimes. This is Catherine was saying, but, um, you know, it's, it's, um, the, the characters that just you might have written years ago, but you still kind of got in the back of your head. They just, you know, they haunt us. Sometimes. <laughs> Are you haunted, Andy, by your character? Uh, I am actually, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which character? Uh, well, it was Lockie Munro was, uh, was the character that's haunted me. And um, uh, I worked on uh, Squizzy Taylor a few years ago and I, actually can't stop researching squizzy so yeah there's i'm, I'm haunted <laughs> help me <laughs> um in terms of the um those those characters is there a character in your books that you've sort of really liked doing apart from lexi and your, your main characters but is there um another one that you sort of enjoyed and would want to bring back dawny oh, oh excellent yeah, i was yeah. Hoping you say Dawny. I love Dawny. Uh, for those who have yet to read the book, Dawny is a wonderful um, older neighbour of Lexi. Dawny was introduced to just um, lighten some of the heavier parts of the plot and to provide, I guess, a little bit of comic relief. And she is one character that I just didn't have to think about at all. She was in my ear. She almost created herself. I don't know where she came from, but um, yeah, I, I loved writing Dawny. That was great. Yeah. She could almost have her own book. She almost, yeah, almost. But I think I think the bouncing <laughs> off Lexi is is what you know really brings it to life. Yeah, yeah. And what about you, Bert? Um, I found, and I as I go on, I I found um all my characters in my latest book hard to formulate. Because I, I, you know, when you've written 10 novels, you know, you've had, a te you know, you've had a book about a teacher, you've had a book, you know, um, about a doctor, you've had a book, you know, you've had, you've, and I've always really tried to focus on professions. I love what people do and I really try and make that part of the plot and who they are. So um, with the latest novel, I was just clean out of ideas, to be honest, about characters and um so uh, with the paramedic um i have had a long held obsession with paramedic you know ambulance shows so i was able to draw on on you know um many many hours of watching ambulance shows in the past and and then um with the other um character in this book jess who's a, a boxer um, you know, I got that idea when I was sitting in the pub one night when I was away on my holidays and there was a wrestling match going on and I thought, oh, I can have a character as a boxer. I've never had that before. <laughs> and of course, then researching that and making that believable um, was, you know, very, very difficult. But um, in the end, it fed in quite nicely to the plot and, you know, that fight or flight idea. Mm. Um, and, um, and then I ended up with a police detective and um, trying to solve who's 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 shot this man and and why and 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 she was also very difficult because as I said detectives are busy so researching anything is is hard they've only got limited time and 
I have never written from a detective's perspective before, so it was difficult. Um, um, and so she was a mother, so I, I did focus a lot on her her children in the novel, and, and because I felt that was the only thing in the entire novel I knew anything about. Mm. Oh. Did, did you do any research on the boxing? Did you do any training? Did I, I, I didn't train, um, but I had a very helpful um, gym in Warrywood um, who were amazingly welcome and thought it was very normal for a writer to come into the gym to... <laughs> you know ask them all questions they would I would arrive in and and they would go and get me a seat next to the ringside and <laughs> you know they were they were absolutely wonderfully helpful yeah oh, I love the boxing scenes they were great and uh, what about you Catherine um yeah I was just thinking actually um it's been very different I write for children and adults yeah you know, and young adults and writing for children and often young adults, the main characters got to be far more lovable than, the, than, than they are in adult books. Like adult books have to be sort of more realistic and they've got to be mixed kind of characters. So in a way, that's why it's more stressful <laughs> writing adult books because when you've got those kids lovable characters that you actually really enjoy being with because they're just gorgeous and then in the adult ones you're not really as happy to spend endless amounts of time with people who are more like real people <laughs> and who's an introvert anyway me so you know you don't want to be spending enormous amounts of time with annoying people slightly annoying people they're never wholly annoying people and usually they go through that character arc where they're there's something annoying about them and then they manage to somehow resolve it or something at the end. But with, with kids' books, they tend to be a bit more, they, they're just more appealing, the yeah. characters, I think. Do you, do you have a preference for genre? Because I was sort of looking at it, I was like, it's pretty much, a, you've covered every... Just about. Just about. Yeah. It's sort of like, which um, one haven't you done? Preference of genre. Well, you know, I like my historical, do like my history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Um, I do like it. I've covered it so much because I like to try and something different and try and master it or at least get good at it or whatever, you know. So it just it just depends on at the time. And what I'm particularly interested in at the moment is pacing and that kind of thing. And that that's what I'm interested in at the moment. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm doing it. So at the moment, that's what I want to, you know, that's my favourite. But it just depends. But I can see in a few years, it's not as good for your mental health doing this stuff as it is doing really nice children's stuff. <laughs> so I might have to go back to the really nice children's stuff. I think there is a, a duty of care that, you know, when you are sort of writing crime, you need to be aware of because, you know, you can be researching some pretty dark and nasty stuff. I, I, do any of you sort of have a, a process for protecting yourself if you're, you know, researching anything like that? Sarah, right. Sarah's <laughs> topic matter was <laughs> difficult. I basically, um, I wrote most of Unforgiven in my office and I would put it down and then I'd walk out and then I'd be mum again. I'd try not to carry the thoughts of what I was doing. And it's quite different because most books are in my head the whole time and I'm planning and plotting them. But a lot of the early research for that was really tough. Um, I didn't write a lot of it into my book, as you know, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to deal with that too much. But just the, um, yeah, the initial research, I just leave it behind and get up and go and do something else and not spend too much time on it, um, you know, each time I sat down. And then I'd, I'd go and write a lovely um, scene as well and something a little bit funny and, um, and just, yeah, just lift myself back up a little bit after, after that, so... Because the um the two detectives have got a, a really lovely relationship. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and there is so much more to the book. Like I said, um, yes. <laughs> it's just um, the research had to be done, and I had to know what I was talking about, and I had to know how to to build Lexi. But once I'd done that, I I wrote the emotional few scenes that are in there, and then I got on with the rest of the book. So I could just put that down. I didn't have to revisit it again till the end. Yeah. Do we have, um, do you sort of feel that sort of by the end of these books that you've, um, you've sort of learned something new about your, 
yourselves? Or is this just a, um, are they just, you know, the next book and you've moved on to the, you know, the next one after that? I definitely, I think um, I, I've learned so much through every book and, yeah. and I think they do take you um, through the research and um, you end up with a weird collection of knowledge about all sorts of things in life, you know, mm. often um, it comes out when I'm being a mom and somebody says, oh, I, I think I'll do this. And I'm like, well, don't do that because of X, Y, Z. And it's really bizarre sometimes what I'm saying. And it's because, you know, things you learn through research um, broadens your horizons and I and I suppose because we're of the things we or the type of books we write you're probably a little bit less trusting of the world um as well and overly suspicious and paranoid <laughs> <laughs> but also maybe a little bit more empathetic yeah. because you get in so many heads in you know, the characters heads that, um it helps you see things from many different perspectives I think on the same issues um so yeah I've definitely become a lot less judgmental than my younger self, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the, is it chicken or egg there? I mean, because you have to be sort of empath empathic to get into somebody else's shoes in the first place, I think. But but on, at the same time, when I'm writing a book, I have, like people say, no, like write what you know, and you and it's not exactly that because you have to do the research, but what you have to know is something inside your main character, something inside your main character that you can, that is emotionally exactly the same, some, something that you can relate to. So even though that character in many ways is different from you, you can go to that core thing, which is the same. And like the last book that I've just finished, not that one, but this other one, um, she's a mum with a daughter, which I have. Um, and her mothering style, and I, I was kind of, when you're saying learning about yourself, I was using stuff, pulling it out and thinking, yeah, that's probably a little overwhelming, isn't it, actually? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, but I used it. I thought, oh, that would be good for, for this person if I just pushed it a little further. Crazy but good, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you can sort of use the stuff that's in you. But when you pull it out and put it in there, you sort of think, hmm. And it does teach you something about yourself, I think. Mm. Which is probably a good point to um, put to the audience. If there's anything that they would like to ask, now is the time to um, start bringing your questions forward. Well, well, Petronella's got a question. Uh, the one that I just literally finished like last week. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's about actually, to be honest, my, my publisher hasn't actually finished reading it. So, I mean, my agent thinks she'll like it, <laughs> <laughs> but I hope it is. So I hope so. But yeah, it's about, um, it's another woman. I, I decided, you know, I had this thing, I was going to do, some middle-aged women heroines um, because, you know, so many of the readers are middle-aged <laughs> women just like me. So, like, why not, you know? So, yeah, it's, she's, uh, it's another psychological one um, and she's a contact tracer. Yes, yes, I want to keep going because um, I feel like, like I, every single one of them, and particularly this last one, I think is pacier even than the one before. Like, I'm kind of... I think I'm getting into my stride now. So, yeah. Hello, and as, um, as a reminder for those Zooming at home, um, you can send in your questions on chat and as a couple of you have already. So this is one from our Zoomers. Uh, how do you persuade people to help with the research when you were starting out? So it's that kind of first approach question I guess you know really if I persuaded them I just sometimes it's it's amazing what people will give you if you just ask them at the right time in the right way um and it I mean it does help if you know someone even if it's through someone else and then you've got an opening but sometimes um you just yeah you just got to ask because you'd be you'd be really um amazed at how many people are, are more than happy to help maybe not at midnight but some are <laughs> I, I agree. And um, I've only ever had one person say no. 
and and that was actually a family member and um and it was because the experience was too traumatic for her to want to talk about it and and as a result actually the fact that she said no at the time i was kind of devastated and um um but Afterwards, I was really relieved because I could say, well, actually, all of this was researched and it really isn't a novel about what happened to you. It's a it's it's it kind of liberated me from the fact that I had originally thought of her when, you know, I came up with the premise. Hmm. I don't think it. they don't always. Resp I'm just encouraging this person. They won't necessarily always respond. I've had some people who just don't. But. It's a, it is very amazing. It's an easier thing to do to actually ask the horse's mouth, but actually it's amazing if you can't get somebody what you can find on the internet. If you just go down that research rabbit hole, like you can find amazing stuff if you look, hmm. you know, and you may not. And sometimes you go, you do that, and then you find somebody, and then you can match it up what you've learned against what you talk about with them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's just so much material on the internet that, just kind of think, well, how did how did we exist before the internet? <laughs> and you actually studied history as well. So I was like, I kind of think of like, yeah. you know, 30 years ago, all those history books and the you know, trawling through microfilm and old yeah, newspapers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, but it is kind of when you the first few times you ask someone, it, it is a bit challenging. It's that sort of cold calling thing, and um, you get you get better at it, and you will get people saying no, and but you'll get lots of other people that say yes. Um, I'll normally probably write an email too. I won't just call, call someone. I'll say, would you mind if I call you to discuss yeah. this? So it just gives them a bit more time to process that someone's asking them for information mm, and, mm. and find out if they want to, I suppose, whether you're legit or whatever. But I found that that's the best way to approach people that you don't know at all for the first time. We have, uh, we have another question from our, our Zoomers. Um, to what extent is your writing to address or advocate for the social issues you're writing about? Kind of a tricky one there, but. I did get asked this a lot with, um, you had it coming because it um, came out, um, you know, shortly after um, Chanel Contos was um, campaigning to have consent taught at schools. And um, quite a few people went, oh, you're on topic, aren't you? And um, and, and obviously the book was written 12 months before that happened, but um, I, you know, said, well, look, I'm a parent of two teenage children. I'm, I'm writing about what's bothering me and what's bothering me is, you know, this is happening. And, you know, how do we, you know, protect the girls and how do we protect the boys? I'm writing about, you know, what's concerning me. So I can't say that I ever... I, I, I write about what bothers me rather than what's a hot topic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it becomes a hot topic and it's it's not deliberate. Yeah, you're sort of tapping into the fact, when it became a hot topic, I got very scared and, and I went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> um, I had another question. Oh, that's right. The um, question here was, is there a topic that you won't write about? Well, it's just, it's just my eye line. <laughs> I won't write about a topic that I don't, I'm not really driven to write about. Again, it's not about the hot topic at the time. It's got to be something that um, you're passionate enough about um, to explore and to get right. It's really important with any social issue that you do your research and you make sure you know what you're talking about. And to do that is you know, maybe hundreds of hours of research. So you've really got to want to write it. It's got to come from a part of you that's not about what the next big trend is. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you might not want to write about something today, but you may write about it in the future. Um, I, with one of my earlier novels, um, it was um, based on the troubles in Northern Ireland and I, and it took me 10 years to pluck up the courage to write that novel because I'm not from you know the north of Ireland I'm from the south of Ireland and um you know it felt um, twice as tricky because I was from the south of Ireland writing about the north of Ireland and and so it took me a long time to pluck up the courage to write it and um so even though you might not want to 
write about something today, I would probably say there isn't a topic that I can that I can say categorically that I would never um, touch. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to say something. No. Um, <laughs> honestly, there are topics you can't write about. What What are those for you, Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> get into delicate issues yeah it is, it is quite a it can be quite a minefield sort of yeah. juggling um as i was sort of saying earlier like it's that personal protection as well as you just don't want to go there yeah i think and um you may tread on toes no matter how well intentioned you are and then you are maybe, fortunately, I've never been famous enough to really have to worry <laughs> about becoming the centre of some kind of shit storm. But um, some people do become, uh, get, end up like that. And it would, must be hideous, hideous. Sometimes family can be a big um, yes. prohibitor. Actually, that's the other thing. So there are some, there are some relatives you think, great story, but I know they won't want me to do it. <laughs> And you're supposed to have a streak of steel and be an artist and keep doing it anyway. But, oh, you know, having to put up with that kind of. Nobody wants to take on, you know, something that will, you know, gain family disapproval. I would say actually that probably is a no for me because I couldn't quite live with the consequences. Mm. Yeah. Our families are um, quite tricky with, your, with writing, aren't they? They're always asking you what you're working on. And then when the book comes out, they're kind of, finding things that they think of them or their story and you got to do a lot of explaining. Um, do we have any other questions from the, yep, down the back? Oh <laughs> my you. God. Amazing. So, <laughs> Ditch. S-T-I-T-C-H. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we've, we've, to... I think we'll remember that. I think a lot of people have written that down in the audience. <laughs> yeah, for those uh, who are Zooming and don't hear the question, that was uh, an answer to the, the start of the interview where, where Catherine was wanting a database of people they could contact. And we've just found out there is one called Stitch. So <laughs> a friendship group, sorry. Are you talking about like the Inquisitor and really? I thought they were so dead. So dead. <laughs> they cold books. <laughs> oh, well, that's just because there probably weren't many of them to start with. But, oh, well, the, oh, well that's really that's really great to know. Um, well, to be honest, they might be cold books, but they didn't sell very well. So nobody's been sort of so honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's it's high, it's really complicated medieval stuff. It's, I guess, and it, look, honestly, I think it was before its time. The amount of, yeah, the amount of research I had to do to try and get, I mean, and this was before the internet, really. I mean, that's how old I am. The, um, but the 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 stuff I had to try and dig up on things like, um, you know, the Templars and all that for, for things, and now they it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Like you don't have to, and you know, you've got the internet as well. But yeah, I think they were a bit, pre if they came out today, I might've had a different story really. The narrative drive. <laughs> oh, okay. If she writes another one, it might be very, very fast with a <laughs> fast paced. Because you, 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 with your latest novels, you were saying yeah, the no, the, the, the old ones, those other ones had a more sedate pace than the new one. Maybe actually, I think that I think I could probably do it electronically because I think I've got the rights back because they're that old. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> thank you for telling me that. You've no idea how much that's warmed the cockles of my heart. <laughs> Sorry. For everybody else who've never heard of them, they're actually these three 
medieval mysteries that are based on around the Inquisition, the medieval Inquisition, not the Spanish Inquisition, the medieval Inquisition. <laughs> like, see, this is how petty and medieval it gets. Really. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So that's what it. That's what's up that all about. But we better get off the topic because it's not really about. What we're talking about. It's about the past, the past. Oh, it's the past. <laughs> of course, it's the past. We have. Was there another question over here or? Uh, yep. Yeah. That's right. Well, you, you can get their card off them. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that's probably going to have to be the uh, the last one for the session. So please join me in thanking our guests. And if it was... Now, our, um, our speakers will be available to sign copies of their books opposite the library bookshop just outside the room. And um, we ask you to leave the room um, even if your next session is in here, um, just because we have to clear it and all that and enjoy the rest of the festival. Yeah.